Unlock car door leads to almost a decade of aggravated stalking. This is a long one, but it was so bizarre I think it's worth telling. I wanted to post it because this person recently tried to friend my now husband on Facebook. And it brought back some crazy memories and I need to vent it out. I got married right at 18. I was a pretty book smart kid, but lacked street smarts. By the time I turned 20, my now ex-husband and I had moved into a rental property in a pretty nice suburb outside Chicago. In the basement of the house was a big mother-in-law suite where a good male friend of ours, Nick, lived as well. I was about halfway through nursing school at this time. This particular semester of nursing school, I had a very early clinical rotation once a week. I was 21 at the time. I'm not a morning person, so in order to maximize the amount of time I spent asleep, I started loading up all my stuff into my car the night before. Bags, books, and even my purse. Again, street smarts lagging. One particular night before clinicals, I asked my ex-husband Bobby to get a book from the car. Bob does, but forgets to lock the door. The next morning when I get to my car, I know that my purse is gone. I ended up filing a police report. I was most concerned because I just got this new job as nurse's aide at a hospital, and I had my social security card still sitting in my wallet. Strike three for street smarts. Almost immediately after the theft, strange things start to happen. We started getting ding-dong ditches all hours of the day and night. Someone vandalized mine, Nick's and Bob's cars, with strange graffiti, Nazi swastikas, hangmen, etc. egged our house, slash Nick's tires. We first shocked it up to a neighborhood prankster, but when we started having damages that cost some decent money, we called the police. Not to mention one day, when Bob was mowing the lawn, he noticed piles of cigarette butts outside the bedroom window. The police came out, pretty much did nothing but take a report and told us perhaps to invest in car alarms and bring some brighter floodlights for the driveway. A few weeks after this, at 2.30 in the morning, I get a call on my cell. It was the police in a neighboring town. They had picked up someone who had my ID on him, someone named Craig J. While they asked why he had someone else's ID on him, he claimed I was his girlfriend. The police called me because my name popped up for a police report for theft. I assured the cops I never heard of him before, and was told that I could pick up my ID at the police station within the next few days. Things really started to escalate at this point, and I still didn't make the connection that perhaps these incidences were related. I started getting strange messages on MySpace, this was in 2009, as well as on Facebook, from clearly fake accounts with long, widened messages that made no sense. This person started messaging friends of mine as well. I deleted MySpace and blocked the person on Facebook, but new accounts kept getting created. Somehow this person got my email address and started sending emails as well. I had no idea who this person could be, but they seemed to know details about me that indicated that this was either someone I knew or knew someone I knew. The messages weren't overly threatening, but creepy enough to where I started becoming uncomfortable. One night, my friend Lauren and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. Bob, Lauren's husband, and a few other friends had gone out for the night. As we're sitting around chilling, we hear something that sounds like someone shaking the garage door. It was an attached garage. I go and check the garage. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. We had occasional issues with raccoons, so I chalked it up to that. But the noises kept continuing, Lauren and I getting freaked out at this point. Now understand the layout of the house. It was a modern style ranch house with no upstairs. The garage sounds moved now to the kitchen window, a distinct sound of someone knocking or scratching hard on the windows. We called our husbands, who did not answer. At this point, we debate calling the police. What if it was an animal or tree branches? We don't want to seem stupid. As we debate, I see Lauren's face go sheet white and look past me. I spin around and I can see the locked, unfortunately, handle of the front door wiggling. We are seated near the kitchen. We jump up. Lauren grabs a knife from the butcher block on the counter. I grab a small hammer from the junk drawer. We book it to the back of the house where the bedrooms are. Cell phone in hand, and we lock ourselves in the bedrooms and call the police. The dispatcher tells us to stay on the line, move furniture in front of the door if possible, and the police are on their way. We shove a dresser in front of the door, knife and hammer in hand, 
We agreed if this fucker was going to come in, he might be bigger or stronger than us, but he's not going down without a fight. We plan, if he gets in before the cops, I go for the head with a hammer, and she goes for the gut with a knife. Cops show up, banging on the door, shouting, Police! We can see the red and blue lights through the window. We leave the room, let the cops in. They find no signs of anyone present or evidence of an attempted at break-in. They take a report, and the meanwhile, our husbands finally call us back. They come home and the cops leave. Flash forward a few months. A very close friend of ours, Sean, was renovating his apartment and needed a place to crash along with his girlfriend. Bob and I decided to, he could stay in the third bedroom in our house. The first night Sean stays with us, we are awakened at 2 in the morning by Sean screaming at someone. Bob and I jump out of bed and rush into the hall and to Sean's room. Sean and his girl are wide awake, lights on, looking totally freaked out. The screen is sliced and flopping in the wind. Sean told us he woke up to someone using that, what he thought was a knife on the screen and started climbing in through the window. We call the cops. They come out and take a statement. Sean describes the guy as best as he could, a white male, young looking, semi-shaved head with what looked like a darker hair. Cobb desk for fingerprints comes back as a match for Craig J. Turns out I knew who he was vaguely. He was a year younger than me and we had gone to the same high school, but I couldn't remember having any significant interactions with him. He lived with his parents only a few blocks from my parents' house. Upon realizing that Sean had just moved in, the cops made a statement that chilled us all. He probably didn't realize anyone was staying in this bedroom and thought the room would be empty. Cops go there, arrest him. <sighs> he suddenly has quite the story for them. Him and I were secret lovers. I was ignoring him. We had a relationship. He had been allowed into my house many times. I am floored. He gets charged with something like trespassing or breaking and entering and does time for maybe a month and has to pay a fine. In the meanwhile, I get a restraining order against him. He gets out and I hear nothing of him. I also develop a completely irrational fear of first floor windows. Around Christmas of 2010, I am now 23 years old. I figured the whole Craig thing is in the past. Bob and I decided to divorce unrelated to this and go our separate ways. And Nick has long since moved out. We end the lease. I moved to a less desirable suburb, but with affordable rent. I settled on an apartment in a four unit building that has a locked entrance. And the only way in was with a key or with someone opening the door from the inside. I live on the second floor, but this time I graduated and was now a nurse and working now at a nursing home. Spring and summer of 2011, it's started up again. The call is coming to me at work only to have someone hang up. Letters suddenly appear in the staff only mailbox, mailed to me with no return address. The strange email started up again from random accounts. The messages were never overtly threatening, but they were long, way too frequent, way too out there. He spoke to me as if we were long lost friends and had some sort of connection. I don't think he ever threatened to hurt me, although the cutting in the house with a knife? I don't know what was going through his mind. What I kind of seemed to piece together over the years from all his rambling is that he had some sort of crush on me when I was in high school or something, but I don't remember speaking to him even, and him having to rob my car was some sort of sign from the universe or something that we were meant to be together. I called the cops. They basically told me that because there have been no threats other than like an OOP or a cease and desist, there's not much that they could do except wait and watch. This goes on for a little while, and finally one night, I wake up at 2 in the morning to the doorbell ringing. I'm instantly in a panic. I look at the window there, illuminated in the floodlight is Craig. I burst out crying. In my half-awake state, I run across the hall and start banging on my neighbor's door. He was an older divorce guy who lived alone. He goes downstairs, confronts Craig, and tells him the cops have been called. He takes off. I file a report. They claim they will talk to him, but this only makes things worse. Friends I have on Facebook now starting getting random messages from, from Craig, asking about me, telling them he has important information for me. Other time he alternates saying, I owe him money and I have a debt I need to pay off. My friends block him as he goes along. Meanwhile, my younger sister is living in the city with a few friends. He somehow finds out where and drives to her apartment and confronts her while she has people over. She freaks out, they kick him out, she calls the cops who basically again state that he didn't com commit a crime, but offer her a restraining order as well. Right after this, another incident. 
My younger cousin is a high school senior on the cross country team. He shows up at my cousin's practice. Cousin has no clue who he is. He starts demanding information on me. Coach gets involved. Craig gets in a fight with the coach. The cops are called. He's banned from school grounds, but nothing more. He calls a nursing home administrator at my job, asks him to talk to me, and that he has important information to tell me. The administrator tells him to not come up onto the property, or will have him arrested for trespassing. At this point, I'm paranoid beyond measure. Then, just as quickly as it started, it faded off. It's now summer of 2012, and the final chapter in the saga, I'm 25 years old now. A friend of mine named Stacy, and incidentally, Sean's ex, moved in with me temporarily while she looked for a place. She was dating a new guy and spent quite a few nights at his place. One night, I picked up a double shift, starting at 7am and ending at 11.30pm. Stacy texts me around 3.30pm, stating she won't be home that night and was going out with her guy. I arrive home at almost midnight. First thing I notice is that the door is unlocked. Uneasy, but thinking perhaps Stacy had just forgotten to lock it, I cautiously peer inside. I pan my gaze to the kitchen and living room. I can't shake the feeling that I'm unsettled. Something wasn't sitting right. Due to all of these incidences, I always made sure that one or two lights were on, even when we weren't home. I was still not fully in the door when I realized that I was staring into a pitch black apartment, and immediately my brain went into full panic. And I'm glad it did, realistically. Stacy could have forgotten to leave a light on, but my instincts were in overdrive and it's and it sounded like alarm bells. My Puerto Rican neighbor who lived in the one building units was known for his weekend parties, and I could hear a party going on downstairs. I book it down the stairs and burst into the party, and I tell him what happened. He looked at me like I'm crazy, but agrees to come upstairs with me. We get inside, he looks around, we see nobody. I'm starting to wonder if I'm going nuts. Maybe Stacy had her boyfriend over and they left in a hurry. Forgetting to turn on the low lights and lock the door, he agrees with me and sort of jokingly pulls open the pantry door. What I saw next will never ever leave my mind. There crouched inside is Craig. Puerto Rican neighbor puts a guy in a chalk hold. I call the police. To this day I have no idea what he planned on doing. Cops come out and he's arrested because my neighbor was having a party. He had the door open to the alleyway. Chances are, he just walked into the building. People assumed that he was there for the party or whatever. It's more confusing on how he got into the apartment itself. My theory is, my roommate at the time was from the country. While I lived in a suburb, it was the type of suburb right on the edge of a major US city. So we always locked our doors and generally kept everything secured as a rule. She was used to leaving her doors unlocked and wide open. And I think honestly, it may have just slipped her mind when she went out for the night. I confronted her about it and she of course denied it, but that's really the only logical way he could have gone inside. I always locked both the doors and the dead ball whenever I left the house. Unless he was a skilled locksmith, I have no idea how he could have gone inside. I didn't stay alone or go anywhere by myself for a long time after that. I feel that I actually developed a paranoia because of all of this and was highly suspicious of giving my number or any information out to anyone actually. He ended up being charged and convicted of aggravated stalking, breaking and entering, and some other charges. I did meet his parents in court, who were both very shockingly normal, apologetic people. They tried to explain their son. They claimed he was mentally ill and suffered from bipolar disorder. When he's medicated, he's okay. When he's off his meds, he's nuts. After he served time, I did not hear from him for years until 2016, when he found me on Facebook. I was much older now, around 29. I replied to him very firmly that any contact would end in the police being called and that I had no interest in him at all. I blocked him in any way I could. Recently, he found my new husband on Facebook and fronted him. He blocked him as well. To this day, I still have a paranoia. I have parked my car near a baseball diamond once and some kids most likely hit a baseball into the windshield and took off because of a perfect baseball-sized spider crack on the glass. Despite it being completely logical that it was most likely a ball, I instantly referred to, oh god, is he back? I have no idea what happened to him. I am also now a total psycho about keeping things locked. Twice my life got screwed up because doors weren't locked. My car door, and most likely my apartment door. I have an acquaintance monitor him on Facebook, and from what I've seen, 
he appears to go through periods where he's pr pretty inactive, and then episodes where he's rambling, overposting, oversharing, and acting generally deranged. I believe his parents were telling the truth when they say he's medicated, he is okay. Part of me feels bad for him. I'm older now, and I've been a nurse for almost 10 years now, some of which was spent in a psych specialty. The mind is a hell of a thing. Looking back on it now, those were some of the worst years of my adult life. He put me through a lot of anxiety and caused a lot of issues for me. I slept with my couch pushed against my apartment door for the next two years before I moved out of there. I'm now married, but on nights where I'm home alone, I still find myself resisting the urge to stack furniture in front of the doors. One of the other fallouts of the situation, Craig either sold, lost, or gave away my social security card that had been in my purse. Someone tried to file for Medicaid benefits on Arizona using my name and social, as well as obtain a job using my social and failed to pay my taxes, leaving me with a surprise asset freeze by the IRS and a whole financial mess that needs to be untangled before they unfroze my accounts and pay me back the money they started to pull out of my paychecks for the back taxes I had nothing to do with. My credit got extremely messed up for years because of it, and to this day, I have a lock on my social security number and monitor my accounts like a hawk. Moral of the story? Never leave your purse in the car. Always lock your doors. My ex from 10 years ago is still following me. About 10 years ago, when I was 14 years old, and I just started to realize I was a lesbian, a beautiful girl I barely knew asked me out. I was just thrilled to be noticed and have someone want me, so I ignored the fact that I didn't really know her that well, and she kind of gave off a cold, distant, creepy vibe that was in direct conflict with my spunky and warm attitude. I figured there was no way she would ever hurt me, especially since she was a woman, and I've never heard of a woman abusing another woman before. I was ridiculously naive. I know that now. A few weeks into the relationship, she started beating me when she didn't get what she wanted, even sometimes doing so in front of people. No one did anything. They politely looked away. She started demanding I have sex with her, even physically forcing me to do so, and threatening to kill me if I did not comply. It took a few months. But my fear of her was finally overridden by a desire not to be the girlfriend of some sociopath, and I dumped her and told my mother, her parents, the police, and everyone who had been around us what she had done. My ex swore she would kill me. Those were the last words she said to me. My parents believed her. Her parents believed me. The police believed me, but I wound up not pressing charges after realizing how unlikely it was that she would serve time. However, she got all of our friends, they all sided with her, and I wound up having to change schools. Soon, we moved to a different city, I got the help I needed, and I felt like a changed person. I moved back to the same city where I met my ex when I started college. It's a huge state university with more than 50,000 students, so I figured I'd probably never see her, and knowing her, it was unlikely that she even went there. She was an actress and a singer and I figured she had probably gone to a school known for those things. My college was known for science and infamous for having a very underfunded art program. On the very first day though, I saw her. I felt a cold stare on the back of my neck and turned around, and there she was, 100 feet away from me, staring me down with a blank expression on her face. I glared at her and then sneered, trying to show her I wasn't afraid of her, and she kept the same cold expression. I turned and walked away at a relaxed pace, and tried to not let it ruin my day, but then it started. Everywhere I went, she was 100 feet away, sometimes she was with some of her friends, and they would all stare at me with the same blank expression. I never engaged them, I never spoke to any of them. Eventually, they even started following me when I wasn't on campus. It got to the point where I can't enjoy a day at the mall, a day with my girlfriend, a trip to the zoo, or even buy groceries without a dead-eyed girl who beat the shit out of me when I was 14 and her weird crew staring at me. They're like fucking zombies, it's creepy. It's been six years since she started following me around. I thought about moving or changing schools, but I know I can't let her ruin my life anymore. It's starting to get creepier and creepier though. 
Sometimes someone knocks loudly at my door and when I go to answer it, there's no one there. But I have this sinking feeling that it's her. Sometimes, random numbers in my area can leave messages of silence for about 30 seconds on my phone. Or I get sent text messages from random numbers asking, who is this? I never respond to the text or voicemails and immediately block the numbers of the senders. I don't always know what to do. I'm not, I know I'm not cracking up. If I ever out with other people and I think I see her, I ask if they do too. And they always say yes. I want to call the cops. I want to fight back. I want to do something to prove that I am not a pushover. But really, I just want to put this all behind me. That's all I've ever wanted. Creepy ex from 10 years ago, please. Let's not meet again. Edit. Just a few things I forgot to mention. I'm in graduate school now. I graduated college in four years. I go to a different university now in an online IT program. I only still live in the same city because my family is here. I've taken self-defense classes and carry pepper spray around me also. Changing where I shopped helped and I haven't seen her in a little while, but the messages still happen sometimes. If I ever see her again, I'm gonna get a restraining order against her at the very least. Updates. I haven't seen the girl since I posted this, and I heard from someone else that she moved to New York recently. I have no idea if this is true, but it feels nice to not have to stay in my house for weeks. I developed agoraphobia because of this. I never leave my house if I don't have to. I even make people call or text me if they feel like coming over and tell me when they're close by. Luckily, my neighbors seem to be aware of my situation somehow, and they look out for me too. In addition, I think it's worth noting that, recently, my girlfriend and I had a jar of pee thrown at us when we were exiting a store. The car drove away so quickly, so we didn't catch the license plates. I'm not sure if it's related, but it could have been someone who knows her. It was a white guy in a red and black van. That's all we know. Stalk for nearly 10 years. I posted a couple little stories here on Reddit. One that happened to me and one that happened to my friend. But what I found out today has left me feeling so creeped out I needed to share it. The relationship between myself and my mom hasn't been a very good one for as long as I can remember. Don't get me wrong, she tried her best, but I just never felt like a real bond between us. A lot of people who met and get to know her find her unlikable, whereas I am quite the opposite. But where men are concerned, we're on the same page. When a man likes, cares, loves us, they put 100% of themselves into it, whether wanted or not. This means that quite a few of my mom's relationships have turned sour and ended in a quite dramatic way. I had catched up with my mom yesterday, and she seemed unsettled. She asked me if I noticed anyone hanging around my house or ever felt like I was being followed. I haven't, but my house is located on a very long, dark road and is the main entrance to our estate. So a lot of cars drive past and a lot park up right in front of my house and sometimes sit there for a while. So I asked her what's going on. When I was about eight or nine years old, my mom has his boyfriend called Rich. He was in a fairly well-paid job and seemed like a nice enough guy, but I never really warmed up to him. He had this big shaggy dog that used to pant a lot. My mom's friend and neighbor used to say the dog was panting her name because the dog was obsessed with her. They were together until I was about 11 years old. They were engaged, but my mom broke things off and that was that, until her neighbor's son saw him parked outside the house when no one was home, and twice more when we were in. My mom never told me what happened, but they had a confrontation over it and he seemed to go away. Well, she was wrong. She was walking home from school with my younger sister yesterday when a blue car turned the corner and who was driving it? Well, you probably guessed it. It was rich, obviously. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. She told my sister to run home and wait for him to pull over and that's when everything came out. She said she felt like he was mocking her. He was grinning the whole time he was talking and everything was said as if he had one-upped her this whole time. He hadn't just been following her work to school and at home, he had followed me too. I moved out when I was 17, first into a flat then to my house when my son was a newborn. He described my front door, right down to the stained glass flower. He described my boyfriend and my son's stroller. I still can't believe it even now. When I told my boyfriend, he was just as creeped out as me. You'd think after this long stalking, a woman and her daughter, 
he would have wanted to take it a little further, but according to my mom, he seemed to get some sick pleasure out of knowing all these things about us and us not being able to stop him. She jotted the reg number into her phone when he drove away and gave it to me, so I know who to look out for, but it's left me feeling uneasy. My boyfriend is a 6'2 gym bunny, so I'm not concerned for her safety as such, but I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach. My mom said that when he drove off, he was laughing, like, hysterically. I can only imagine how awful it was for her, because it left me shaking a little at the thought. Needless to say, from now on, I'll be keeping a close eye on the cars that park near my house. The 15th year. This is my burner. I'm certain the person I'm writing about is on Reddit. It will soon be 15 years since the events I'm recounting happened. I think that's why I'm thinking about it so much today. It seems unreal. I met Jacob when I was 15, he was 20. It was not a healthy relationship from the beginning. The fellow was never physically abusive. Jacob came from a large dysfunctional family with what I now recognize as a malignant narcissist for a mother and a long absent father. He and his brothers basically raised each other and were extremely close. My family was not a shining example of normalcy either, which I think is enough grounds for an accurate picture as what fueled their relationship. We were together for five years. It was tumultuous and towards the end, it was clearly emotionally abusive. But like most abused people, I was blind to that. It seemed normal until one day it wasn't. I won't outline all the sordid details, because as far as this sort of thing goes, it was bog standard. Slowly isolating me, demolishing my perfectly normal personality traits, slowly exerting control on the way I dressed, etc, etc. Between 15 and 20 years old, one changes a lot as he was right there in these formative years while being a complete dick. At 18, I was accepted into a university on the other side of the country, and for a brief time we did long distance, before he moved cross country and in with me. Up until this point, we had never really lived together. I lived with my parents, he had lived with his brother. Jacob was an IT, he was actually quite brilliant at it, but his anger issues and insecurities he had a hard time finding a job once he had moved out to be with me. As you can imagine, things started going downhill quickly. He had some savings, so he was paying his share of bills, but we were together all the time. He was always in the flat, playing video games and brooding. His abusive behavior ramped up at the same time as my experience of a larger outside world of our messed up relationship started giving me pause for thought about the whole situation. I was hesitant to break up with him, because he was all I'd ever known, and he had moved for me, and would be entirely alone should I do that. I know, I know, please cut me some slack. I was 19. Time passed, I turned 20 and broke up with him, and everything basically went to script. It was easier than I thought it would be. I was ready to be done with him, and he went quieter than I imagined he would. There was not a tirade of abuse, only begging and weeping, which was horrible but also a relief. I wasn't expecting him to get physically threatening, and he hadn't. I called my friend Kayla, and she drove her truck over, and Jacob and I brought some of his things down to it, and he rode away in the back. He started living on my friend's couch for a time. I started the processing of him clearing out of my life. I heard from a friend that he had brought a POS car to get around, and sometimes I would see him in it. It wasn't distinctive to look at, but it had a bum muffler, and it was terribly loud. This is relevant. About a month went by, then the phone's call started. He would call me repeatedly between 1 to 4 a.m. At first I answered, telling him to leave me alone. Eventually, I started unplugging my phone at night. I would plug my phone in, and there would be voicemails after voicemail. I started deleting them without listening. Eventually, there would be just one voicemail in the morning, and it would just be him breathing. More time passed, months like this. I knew that Jacob was bouncing from house to house in my distant friend group, but I figured eventually he would sort himself out 
and move away and that would be it. At some point, on certain days when I was in class, I became uncomfortable and I couldn't really put my finger on it. I knew he couldn't get into my classes and to be honest, my first thought wasn't him. I really didn't think he would hurt me. He was being a textbook terrible ex but after 5 years, I still thought I knew him. But this terrible feeling would occasionally still come over me during my certain classes. I would feel very disconcerted and couldn't figure out why. One night, several months post breakup, there was a big snowstorm and I had met someone and brought them home after a party. We were talking into the early morning and at around 4am my phone rang. I had forgotten to unplug it. I saw it was his number. I didn't answer. I unplugged the phone. Then my mobile rang. My new mobile. The one whose number I only had just about a week before. This time the caller was anonymous. I didn't answer. The voicemail was just breathing. It was eerie in my flat, in the unearthly quiet that snow brings down on a city, and my phone ringing one after another. This person I had brought home, I explained to them that I had a creepy ex, and while I was doing that, I heard a car start outside, a very familiar car sound, all at once. I realized what had been bothering me in certain classes for months. It was a sound of Jacob's very distinctive P.O.S. car, and he was outside my flat in the thick of snow at 4 a.m. in the morning, calling me on my brand new cell phone, watching my windows. This is when I felt the first real steering of fear. It had been more than six months at this point. He was clearly not sorting himself out. I went to the window closest to the road. It was dark inside my flat. I didn't think anyone outside would be able to see me looking out. I looked up and down the street and all the cars were dark and under an unbroken layer of snow. I could barely clearly hear his car running, so I knew he was close by. But he had barely clearly been there a long time, since I couldn't pick his car out of the many parked on the street. Eventually, the car stopped running. I knew he had seen my new friend, and me coming back to my place from the party. I felt my heart pounding in my ears. I went to lay down with my friend, after checking the locks on the front door, and locking my bedroom door. I didn't sleep that night. I was awake, listening for that car. At around 6 a.m., I heard a door slam, and I went to look out the window in time to see a figure. Walking through the calf-deep snow away from a car, I recognized as Jacob. The man was definitely Jacob, though he swaddled in many, many layers of coats and looked to be wrapped in a blanket. I called Leia as soon as it seemed a human hour to call someone, and told her everything then asked if she knew or heard what was going on with Jacob, and she told me. Apparently, he had become more and more bizarre, and he was no longer staying with people he knew, because all his good guy credit had run out after a series of incidences involving drunk and belligerent comments, including one time where he had made a pass at a friend's girlfriend and had to be kicked out instead of taking no for an answer. School was closed that day, the snow was too deep, and the city wasn't prepared for it. My new friend stayed with me through the day, but had to walk back to his place in the evening. I had been watching Jacob's car, nothing, just the footprints from where he had walked away from it in the early morning. My mind was full of worry, what should I do, who should I call? I didn't know if I should call the police. Well, why worried about this? Still have not slept for a while, I decided to take a bath to calm myself down. I double checked the locks on the doors and windows in all my flats before I did so. I was in the bath when I heard the front door downstairs scrape open. The sound was distinctive. I very quickly surged out of the bath, wrapped myself in a huge towel and my robe, and ran down the hallway to my kitchen and grabbed the only big knife I had and went to the top of the stairs. I saw him outlined from the reflected light of snow through the open front doors. I could smell him from where I was old and new booze. I don't remember what I said, only that my voice was tight with panic. I said something like, stay where you are. He just looked at me from the bottom of the stairs and in the deepest, calmest voice said, I know how to get in, you know. There I was, cold and barely dressed, holding a knife and cursing myself for not having taken my cell phone in the bathroom with me 
and the absolute lack of tone or inflection in my voice made all my internal alarms start screaming. I was poised on the balls of my feet, wondering what would happen next when he just shuffled back unsteadily, shutting both of my front doors as he went. I went to my bedroom and locked the door behind me and got on my phone and called Jacob's older brother, Robert. I know this seems weird, but I knew, I knew, I knew this family, and even being across the country, I knew that this brother was the only people Jacob would listen to. I told his brother Robert exactly what had happened in the last day and a half, and told him that if no action was taken by him, I was going to call the police in the morning, and I know that Jacob had priors. Robert brought a plane ticket himself, flew the very next day on my part of the country, found Jacob, and took him away with him. A few days later, he called me to tell me that he had bought Jacob another ticket to a very remote territory of the country, and had, and it had been one way, and he was staying with their eldest brother, and he would not be let out of their sight until he had shaped up. I called some friends who confirmed that Robert had showed up on the doorstep of a distant acquaintance place where Jacob had managed to beg to crash on the couch. I breathed a sigh of relief. The snow melted. Jacob's car was still outside my flat. Eventually, someone called it as an abandoned one, and it was toned away. I wish the story ended there. Months went by, and the phone calls kept happening infrequently, but obviously him. I had changed my number twice in this time, and I couldn't figure out where the leak was. One day, I got a phone call from Kayla, saying that a girl in one house where Jacob had been staying was trying to get in contact with me. There are boxes of things he had left behind, and she wanted them gone. I was on the point of telling her just to throw them out. While well, she mentioned there were books, I had given him many beautiful books over the years, graphic novels, etc. It hurt me to think of them being thrown away. I went over to get them. I was packing up the books I wanted to keep when a sheet of paper fell out of one of them. In Jacob's familiar chicken scratch was a very detailed list. Plastic rope, gaffer tape, extra large heavy duty bin liners. The list was long. It was meticulous. It was horrible. A cold wave of nausea and panic washed over me, and I stared carefully, going through all the books and boxes. I found a motley collection of loose leaf and notebooks. In them were detailed fantasies to abduct, rape, and murder me, more and more graphically written. These were bad, but the worst was yet to come. Going over the paper, I realized he had been systematically breaking into my house for months while well, I was not in my flat. Going through my clothes and cataloging new dresses, things I had bought, his speculations on what I was doing, looking in my fridge, sitting in my room and just noting things. He had installed a back door into my computer. He had broken into my email. He was counting stains on my sheets. He was checking what groceries I've been buying. Nothing in his notes had been dated. And he had never written my name on any of the papers, but the details were dead giveaways of me and the timing on just how long he had been doing this. Horribly intimate details of my life with him before were mixed in and wrapped with the conclusions he had drawn from stalking me over the months. Despite the lack of dates, I suddenly felt sure that this list I had found was one of the last things he had written up before his brother fetched him away. It was wedged into the last book I had gotten him as a gift before the breakup. I felt like I was floating outside my body as I watched myself gather up all of his possessions, not just the books I had come here to get and piled them into my car. I left without talking to the girl who had originally called me there. I just started driving and eventually I stopped somewhere. I got out and was sick to my stomach for a while. I still didn't feel like I was in my body. I got a can of lighter fluid that I kept in my car. I found a clear dirt area and burned everything. It was not a, it was not easy. When people say they burn such and such thing, you don't realize how big and disgusting a black smoky fire it makes. To this day, I am astonished that the people weren't called on me, and also I didn't actually harm myself doing this. I was in a state I've never been in before or since, and my biggest regret is having burned those things. I should have gone to the police. I should have raised hell. Instead, I ran. I am a coward. I moved house. Went dark online. Changed phones. Changed every account I ever had, including bank accounts. 
I've only told certain people about this. I've never gone back to my hometown. My mother, my only relative now, moved to a different place several years ago, so I've never even had to make an excuse about that. I haven't changed my name. My life has taken me through living in four different countries. And it will be 15 years soon, but he still found me. I had an email from him two years ago. I can't prove it was him. But I think it is. Ten years wasn't long enough. First of all, I'd like to apologize for the throwaway. My main account has things like local subreddits that could be used for identification, and all things considered, it's probably a good idea that it stays safely anonymous. Things started about a decade ago. I was either a sophomore or a junior in high school, and one of those that was picked on a lot, mostly because I didn't really make an effort to be too, too friendly. After all, I'd just gone through the traumatic sudden loss of my father, and didn't want to be nice. However, I did make a few friends. One of them was this guy in my art class. Shy, socially awkward, soft-spoken, but generally okay. We bonded over anime and video games, and everything seemed cool. School ended for the year. We really didn't talk over the summer, as I was busy avoiding the world. Aside from my internet friends, really didn't think much of it. I'd never been too social. End of summer, school starts again. Apparently, my absence during our time off had bothered him. He was suddenly very clingy, didn't want me to talk to anyone except him, and started to act creepy. He'd shower me in gifts, though several I refused, and really, as a teenage girl who didn't know any better, I was pretty flattered by all of the attention. The flattered feeling ended when he started showing up at all of my rehearsals for the school play. He showed up at every art club meeting, where he never had before, and the kicker? He'd randomly be at my house. Not knocking on the door, asking to see me, just sitting in his car, a house or two down. Pretty sure I heard him outside my window, but never had any proof. I never told my mom, even though that would have been the smart thing to do. However, I did tell two of my teachers, and they took action. I don't know any of the details, but I do know that the boy quit school and was banned from the campus. Things are cool now, yeah? Didn't see him again, and rumors spread around that police had gotten involved. I personally didn't and still don't believe those because I was never contacted by law enforcement. Happy ending, right? Dude doesn't talk to me anymore and I don't see him again. The only thing that happens is a friend likes me to his live journal a few years later when I'm in college, where he's vaguely threatening, but I'm hours away and think nothing of it. In fact, I think nothing of it for several years. He's not even a blip on my radar anymore, but things... But things are never that simple, are they? Keep in mind that we're over a decade away from our initial, from our initial meeting now. I'm back in my hometown and working at our absolute tiny rural emergency room as a receptionist. Nothing glamorous, but it's a job and help pays the bills. Just something to do until I figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. So one evening as I get into work, I take a look at the current patient list, blah blah toothache, blah blah sore throat, blah blah stub toe, like I said, rural emergency room, and we hardly ever have a real emergency. One of the patients did have something wrong with her though, and it looked like she was going to be admitted to our hospital. While I'm catching up on this and other assorted things, my coworker that I'm taking over buzzes a guy back into the ER itself. I look up and do a double take, this guy, big guy, bearded, wearing a heavy metal band shirt and a big fucking fedora is standing there. And he glanced at me with the most hate-filled, disgusted look I've ever been given. Soulless eyes that have nothing but anger behind them and a sneer that would make a baby cry. Now, I'm used to getting dirty looks in my job, and I've even been threatened before because a doctor wouldn't give out narcotics to a seeker. This is nothing unusual for me, but that look was unlike any other. This wasn't some stoned out asshole, this was something personal. At this point, keep in mind, I have no idea who he is. I think I just stared dumbly at him, and my coworker mentioned something about that being weird, and she didn't say anything else about it, and let me take over. Once again, I looked over the patient list, and one of the names finally vaguely looks familiar. I look at the paperwork. And there it was, under emergency contact, his name. It was nothing like getting hit with a ton of bricks, 
It was more like a cold wave soaking me. My breath caught in my throat, and my chest tightened. In fact, I think I might have said fuck out loud, though I don't really remember. I certainly did think it, though. Quietly, I let my nurses know what was going on, since he hadn't said anything or actually done anything. There was nothing we could do but keep an eye on him. He remained in his family member's room until she was admitted, and as he left, he stopped at my desk. Now, in my job, I have to be polite and happy and sympathetic and such, so I smiled and asked if he needed anything, and he just snarled out, jabbing his finger at my chest across the desk. I'll be seeing you later, chica. Yeah, that was a chills down my spine moment. I wish I could say I had a great comeback, that I was witty and smart and badass, but all I could manage was something like a squeak and a cringe backward. So heroic. <laughs> um, anyways, he left for the night and I was a bit shaken up. Managed to get through my shift without incident for the most part until the very end. As morning came, via the camera at my desk, I saw him come in to visit his family member about 10 minutes before the end of my shift. That's fine. To get to our acute care floor, he doesn't need to come near me. Then about two minutes later, I see him leave again. Not enough time to actually visit, and already creeped out enough, I asked a few of our surprisingly awake paramedics to escort me to my car while my relief got there. They did so without question, walking me out the building and into the parking lot. There we saw my friend sitting in his car, waiting near the employee parking lot visitor's lot on the other side of the hospital. My paramedic friends walked me to my car and as added insurance against them, following me home, decided that this was the perfect time to get gas for the trucks. So they hurried back to the ambulance bay and followed me as I drove up. It's a little difficult on curvy roads to pass an ambulance just saying. He gave up, turned around and went back to the hospital and I was home free. My next shift I profusely thanked my coworkers for being awesome and also reported this to my boss and administration. They did nothing but say, if he comes again, you can call the sheriff, but only if he threatens you. Yeah, I really need to get out of there and figure out what I want to be when I grow up. I haven't seen him since, but believe me, I'm waiting. Well, he knows where I work. He doesn't know where I live, or my married name, so chances are I'd only ever see him in the ER, or maybe at the store or something like that. Anyways, a public place. I hope at least. <laughs>